One going through some of the nuts and bolts of uh, going direct to seller and then also to identify referral partners, right? Um, currently on 35 rental units. We picked up a 14 unit property last uh, May, I think it was, April. Uh, five unit in uh, Marysville and then a bunch of different duplexes and triplexes and then did a lot of those properties by uh, doing the burr method, right? Finding properties that were fixers and uh, fixing them up refinancing them, number of lenders here, and then renting them out. So, you know, over time I've, uh, you know, been flipping properties for a while and occasionally I'll, I'll grab a couple units and keep them for myself. And that's how I've created my entire rental portfolio. Done over, uh, we've done over 60 flips and currently doing about 12 or 15 flips a year. I think last year wrapped up with about 13. I only lost money on two, so it's not bad for a crazy market. Uh, yes. There are challenges, hurdles, especially last year. Uh, first, like massive shift that I experienced, and probably a lot of you know, the market went down about 15% since May. Um, overall, you know, I caught the good, good end of the swing and of the year, and most of my properties, I think we unloaded around July. So it was a good year, but certainly had um, one loss in particular. And then this year, uh, it appears I'll probably lose about $5,000 on the deal. But, uh, anyways. Comes with the business. It is a very risky business, um, especially depending on how you're buying properties too. So today's class is really about hunting for deals and going to get into that. Chad's background joined me uh, about four or five months ago. Our team. Yeah. So I uh, my background, some of you guys know, is in lending. So I was a, a lender since 2003, uh, and then before coming to this, I managed teams in California, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina. Illinois, we're the largest holder of real estate in the United States, Blackstone, and the you know, those guys are really like, kind of changed our market back in 2012. Um, and really, my background is in flip property, being the preferred lender for some of the largest flip investors in Northern California and the nation. So, understanding how those guys work, how they operate, it's something I always wanted to do, and out of fear, never did it until Bobby's wife. Prodded me, <laughs> and uh, and then ultimately made the the total career switch uh, to come part of the body. It was also a good yeah. <laughs> so, um, and enjoying it. So that's uh, me. Yeah, and I think uh, you know in this industry, once again, whether you're buying for yourself or helping other people find, like it's important to partner with with people, especially navigate. A lot of the risks that we've been seeing. This is a market that I have not really seen. Maybe a lot of us, I know Sean and Chad and Scott, and sort of like a handful of people here have been really have been in the market for decades. And you guys have experienced some of the roller coaster rides. And I think, um, <laughs> I've been close. I've been close. I've been close. I've been Eight years uh, since I got licensed, but obviously, you know, these are unprecedented. Changes that we've been seeing in the economy due to you know a pandemic, right? And we're seeing the aftermath of it, and um, certainly swings in the market because of that. We're gonna you know, get into a little bit about how um, we're adjusting for that. So we'll get rolling now. So one thing I want to ask you guys, you know, it's important for us. Uh, this is the first time that we've done this class, and so we'd like it from you guys. Like, what do you guys want to get out of this class? Is there something specific? Is there some like a strategy? A Whatever it might be. So I wanted to write those questions down and then hopefully touch on those at some point. If not, then if we don't, but I want to make sure that we're we're getting into that at some point. So and we want this to be interactive. I put uh the slideshow essentially it's there in a packet. There's notes, there are places to write notes down along the way. And then the second one is just a scripts intake form that we use when we're qualifying these and then trying to build the report. Um so I Kind of put that together for you guys to give you an idea of how to do that. Um, it's not natural for all of us, and sometimes it's easy to go through kind of a checklist along the way. So, what are some things that you guys want to take out of this? Um, I think estimating the cost of things and then finding people who do the work. Sit right next to them. <laughs> <laughs>
So sometimes, like in different industries, I've like done that little, in, or I've been involved in that intro thing. I'm like, why are we doing this? And I listen to something like that. Like, you hear the elevator pitch, like I think in the industry, right? Oh, that guy has money. That guy's a contractor. He finds tenants. They do rest, you know, things like that. So you know, we'll have probably have some time to network and connect with people a little bit after. So yeah, a contractor. I was think back on what she says. Deal analysis. You see the property. How you kind of you know dirty down and dirty. Not get actual numbers, but down and dirty and dirty. So yeah, you won't see him until you have to. Yeah. How do you stay organized? <laughs> That's uh, I've been running again for a while by myself, and my wife has helped me. We've hired a virtual assistant. Chad's came on the team, so there's a lot of moving parts for sure. We could dive into that a bit. A lot of these slides are, you know, for the most part on honey deals, a little bit on, uh, you know, how to uh, analyze deals, and we could get into some of these other questions for sure at the end. Uh, what I'm what I'm here for? Yeah, primarily hunting deals. Um, I feel like MLS. Uh, I feel like there's got to be better deals than what MLS has to offer sometimes. Mm -hmm. So kind of networking, primarily knowing the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Where you get your finance? Let's talk about that. We're brokering hard money now. If anybody. <laughs> That's new that or whatnot. Chad joined the team and uh, I actually got my mortgage license as well. Some of you may know. Um, so we are uh, brokering hard money loans as well for financing. So we help Julie and Sal kind of find a property and finance property and certainly help them like promote them a little bit. But well, how great social media is mortgage license? Oh, tons. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, I'm going to say like two questions. Um, Finding deals not on the MLS but no. the wholesalers. Okay. And what is your turn time on your mortgages? Is it shorter? Can it be a few days, a couple days? You know, how long do your mortgages take for as far as the hard money side? So you mean like from contract to close? Yeah. Um, contract, yes, exactly. Yeah, you get, in con you get a contract today and how long is the hard money? Uh, anywhere from 10 to 14 days. So that's kind of long. Mm -hmm. Can be, yeah, but I mean, most sellers like, and they're really trying to sell in three days. Even at the, I've purchased properties with cash, and it's like, especially these properties with you know violations well, and things like that, it could take a while to get a clean prelim, so that could take three to five days. Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately with cash, but for some deals, mm -hmm. um, hard money. yeah, so hard money in general rule of thumb is probably fourteen days. Yeah, and it does change based on your experience level, too. So once right. you get to a what we call pro status or five or more deals. It's essentially a rinse and repeat, right? You're just giving us a scope of work on the property, property details, not necessarily you or your corporation. Yeah. So, and then, uh, what's like the percentage return you're looking for on all these deals, right? Like, I mean, obviously, you're not making the best number on all of them, but where do you want it? Like, on average? Number? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'll pick that one and then we'll kind of get into it. Um, cause some, a lot of these we'll kind of answer as we go. And when Julie asked, so I'll be organized. We can touch on that kind of towards the end. Um, as far as like what, you know, if we're going to look at how to uh, calculate and analyze the market. But for the most part, like I'm kind of on a flat number, but kind of a flat number. Like there are percentages, like we talk about, like this percentage of ARV. ARV is after resale, resale value. But to be honest, like I'm generally looking to make forty to $50,000 per deal. And I will say like 50 is more of a, a number that, has been the target goal these days. It used to be like 35. Only well, because there's there's so many more um, elements that factors that can come into uh, analyzing deals. How long is it going to take on the market, right? Now, every three days on market are longer. Um, inflation cost went up a ton for all materials and things like that the last couple of years. Obviously, when you open up the walls, you guys are getting started. Oh man, we didn't calculate for that. So there's um, obviously having some cushion in your numbers is important. And, you know, when you're doing hard money, like you're buying cash, it's one thing, but if you're doing financing, it can be, um, you know, challenging to find that exact, uh, you know, number that you're trying to hit with like, everything that's going on in the market and the economy. So on average though, 40, 50,000 is like what, like what I, what we kind of analyze, but everyone's different, right? You know, if it's your first deal or something like that, like, you know, making $20,000 is a lot of money, right? You make, you do 10 deals in a year, it's $200,000, right? If you kind of get some higher and lower, you know, obviously that, that can uh, that can vary. So that kind of rule of thumb for what, what we do. What we will
Sure. Most of us, how do you negotiate those guys that mean that you your property? Um, with wholesalers, you know, it's man, it was a really like a, a flying man type thing, right? Like I looked at a property yesterday, and I was like, "There's no way I'm going over 365." And telling that in my mind, and he said someone else at 370. I was like, "All right, I'll do 370." Like, <laughs> text me, text me later. It's like we got a verbal commitment at 380. Could you do that? And so I'm like, "Yes." So it's one of those things, like you know, what are you gonna do at the end of the day, like? The person who holds the contract sometimes has has the ability to manipulate what what, what price is going to be and whether they're truthful with some things and what other offers come in at. Um, obviously, things are different these days. There's left investors out there that are buying properties, so that's one thing, right? Competition isn't as scarce. I know we talked about finding deals on MLS. Like it's it's easier right now than it has been, although inventory is low again. So we'll kind of get into the presentation and every you know slide that we've got going on here. You guys can ask me questions if you need some more clarification on some things, and we can you know do a Q and A at the end too. We'll um, hopefully have some time for like networking and talk a little bit after. So we we'll are rolling into chat. Next slide. There we go. Oh, you can see me, but oh, all right. I mean, I'm gonna get into this quick. So this is uh, just a little thing that I read in a book. Hey, is your reticular activating system your rats, right? So when you're out and you buy a car, you buy a Lexus, a white Lexus, I'm gonna have. On the street, what do you see on the freeway? I'm generally going to see that white Lexus, right? So this is kind of shift in our mindset, right? If you're a traditional realtor, you've always been helping traditional buyers and traditional sellers, and you're going through a neighborhood and it's boarded up and there's tarps on the roof and things like that, I think it's just changing your mindset is something that is a goal today as we're thinking out in the world. I know Scott and I have been connected the past like 18 months or something, like something either we got closer or you know his mindset shifted a little bit. He's like dropping his daughter off at school. He's like, oh man, look at this house is all boarded up and stuff. I'm like, sweet, thank you, man. Like, we'll, we'll see if we can make a deal up. So it's changing your mindset on these things and how you're, you're thinking about real estate and where money can like be hiding under this rock under here that you don't even realize. Uh, do you guys also do commercial property? Um, no, I've, I've sold some commercial properties, but it's especially, you know, I apartments. Technically, anything over four units is commercial. So I do that 14 unit apartment, and there's another five unit, and then some things like that. But uh, not office buildings, not gas station. I've sold some of these things, like listed them for clients. But um, you know, price. You know, I think another thing: don't get too squirrely, kind of stay in your lane. Whether it's your neighborhood you want to focus on, or you know, better my bath count, and a lot of these different things that I've kind of learned, especially this past year, um, that you want to be comfortable with the what you're, you're aiming towards is your goal so yeah all right so we'll be rolling so where do these deals come from they're flips are distressed deals right someone who has like a perfectly good home not trying to fire sell that thing right so they're always in most cases distressed uh situations it's a higher probability that the seller is in some type of financial position right and they require that cash up front like they want it quick right there's a lot of things and we'll talk about this later you know trust probate there's things going on emotional things that are going on where they don't want to deal with i just dealt with this recently where they didn't want to deal with the passing of a loved one and having to go in and fix the house up and do all this stuff right it's just one of those things that um, people have a really hard time with and so that's where you guys us can come in and help them out right doing these deals without uh getting inspections done necessarily or traditional financing these help are sometimes pretty messed up and i don't know if you guys have seen it on instagram we've been posting some yeah. videos <laughs> there, <clears throat> there's no chance of doing a regular law yeah there's a couple of pictures of uh property bought in marysville and it's like call it covid special we got guys here <laughs> it's dude there are rats in the house like Taylor and I actually walked this out. He just stepped out. Him and I are potentially going to buy it together. There were cockroaches going through the dog food. Like it was a pretty disgusting house. And even like my workers, they're like, I don't want to touch anything. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Water oh, well, that's every week now. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a, a rite of passage. Right? Yeah. Yeah. The rain and the cold moves. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> question Do you do courthouse sales? Um, 
I've been there. I haven't personally. So, you know, courthouse versus on market or whatever, like you have to go with cash to the courthouse, right? You yeah. literally have to show a double bag or whatever. Yeah. Bag. Envelope of cashier's yeah. check, right? So you got 300, 400, $500,000. You want to go there. Some people will buy the steps. This is not something I actually talked about in the presentation, but you'll buy there and then you'll refine hard money, right? If you want to keep your cash liquid, but then you're paying closing costs twice. And it's actually very competitive down there. Like, um, not a bad place to find buyers. Like I was talking to Chad, like, we should start reaching out there a bit more and, and connect with the people that are at the courthouse steps that are looking for deals, right? Or maybe they have deals that want to sell you. It's a good networking opportunity. But no, I have, I almost partnered with one person. <laughs> to specifically go after one house and they brought the cash type thing. But uh, it's kind of, it, there's a whole nother scheme or strategy for buying courthouse steps. Or like like auction.com. That I think you can do financing like H-O-M-E. Yeah, uh, there's a few other ones. But, um, yeah. It's certainly a resource for sure. Courthouse is going to require you to do a bunch of homework. Mm -hmm. you're, yeah, your title you're reports points, you're going to pay off. You could be taking on a lot of yeah, and they don't let you in the house. So you've got to go out to the property and get an inch of status. <laughs> you know, so you check them out and try to peep in and try to guess kind of what's going on with that house, right? So there's a lot of variables there. Yeah. And, 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 and it's it's sight on scene, right? So if there's a tenant or not, maybe there is a squatter. It's like, we just, I bought that 14-unit uh, property. <laughs> now you evict four people. Some we did cash for keys. It took six months. Like, you guys are well aware of what the evictions are six months in california right now to evict somebody it is bananas like you know you you have to give a 60 day notice and then you wait for that time frame and then you file at the courts and it's like three to four months after uh your 60 days is up so it definitely is something to steer clear of uh taylor and i and chad are working on this deal in a fairfield right now it was a great deal it's like a 260 purchase and it's worth 520 but there's tenants in it right how you gonna it could be six months Right before they finally leave, and what's the market going to do in six months? And then you got to rehab and do that. So it's um, it's too risky right now, really, to take on deals that have tenants in them, unless maybe it's a multi-family property and the other rents, the other tenants can offset some of that lost income. So, yeah. Can we refer for a good time? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thomas, Ho I've used Thomas Hogan, um, and I'm buying a house. Taking the house home. Uh, <laughs> let me go back. I got a contract on a house that does have tenants in place, but they're already four months along the line in that um, eviction process. So I talked to the attorney. They're going to be out in 60 days or they're willing to do a cash for keys. So 60 days, I'm willing to hedge my bets and get a price reduction for that time frame to, uh, to help with the holding costs. But anyways, point being, I talked to that attorney. They sounded really good on the wall. So I can get you that information later. I can look it up after this class if other people have questions on it. But I've used Thomas Hogan. And honestly, like it's not a fun profession right now, right? These guys used to be able to make money quickly and turn evictions over. A six-month process, and they're only gonna pay a thousand dollars. Right? Like imagine how many you have to do. Like we had to wait, you know, this is back REOs and short sales 10 years ago, I guess, when we made a thousand dollars on something like that. But it's it's a difficult business that I think a lot of people have. Almost wanted to get out of it. Focus like another another practice because it's you know it's a long time to get paid. Your practice very much. So he Gary Link was the the head guy in town and he took a job at the courthouse. Is what I heard. He became a judge. So his practice was sold. I think that guy Thomas Hogan that I was talking about took over his practice. And then he's just impossible to get a hold of. Like I, you know especially like when I when I was doing some evictions last year. Let me pick up the phone. Like, and they're they're a one man shop. You know, the secretary maybe part time, and everyone's kind of um, struggling with the economy how it was, and they're not getting consistent paychecks because the ports were closed for so long, right? They had a they had a moratorium for a year and a half or whatever. Like, what are you supposed to do as a eviction attorney, right? <laughs> Go on vacation, I guess, and take your TGC loans or whatever. All right, sorry. Sorry. So, so with the market shifting, like what's considered a good deal, or like somebody was asking, how do we figure out what those numbers are going to be? What's a good deal? And it, really, a good deal is, this is my thought. There's no like good deal per se. There's risk involved, right? It's protecting yourself from something bad happening down the road, right? And bulletproofing that deal. 
And so what we're doing now is we're looking at what that ARV is now, which is the after repair value. So after that house is completely done, what is the value today? And then we're deducting 10%. We're planning on a six month hold time, right? So for us to go in, by the time we buy it, rehab it, put it on the market, what's the average day on the market right now? Just so you know. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah, it's over 30, right? So you got a month just sitting, and then someone's going to do a regular loan on it, most likely, and that's going to be another month, right? So two months, they're sitting doing nothing. So we calculate, we, we do that six months. Does it happen faster? Yeah, it does, but you want to protect yourself because you have holding costs that are in that, right? You have things that are going on. So every day that it's sitting, it costs money. So we're planning on a 10% drop, six month hold, and then our ARV for a heavy fixer is 50 to 55%. That's doing everything to the house. A medium, you know, it's not doing windows, not doing an AC unit, you know, those big ticket items. Uh, and then light fixers, carpet paint, easy stuff, right? Oh, thanks for switching that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how to analyze deals. And honestly, like as we're working with uh different in uh you could say wholesalers or agents or things like that, this is just a simple way to analyze, right? Like you can get more detailed, obviously, but right off the bat, like most of the time when we're kind of running our numbers, like okay, it ended up being 55% with that that 10% drop. So it, it's a quick way to underwrite a property versus all right, you know. Windows here, floors here, this here, this here, and spending more time on it, we can somewhat eliminate deals on a quicker basis, which we, is kind of this formula. And we still do it all. We'll get a, a sign in sheet. I'll get everybody's email address. I'll send you guys our deal analyzer. So when you get something that's a little tighter and you need to be more specific on cost and acquisition costs, holding costs, resale costs, you can punch everything in and then it'll tell you what your profit is. Potentially is going to be. Yeah. And, right, and, so. and the big thing on like the heavy ones, right? When it seems like 50% is somewhat can be drastic, you're doing everything, right? It's a roof, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, windows, things like that. Time is the biggest hurdle, right? And that's what I've run into on, you know, I've been this for a while, but you run into a lot of projects. In the past, time didn't destroy your profit margin, right? But these days, <clears throat> You know, if the market's going down, it's going down roughly 2% a month. Like, how do you know? I looked at the deal yesterday and the cabinets weren't, you know, I hate painting cabinets, right? And I, usually I get in there for traditionally, it's like, gut it all. And I'm like, well, if you gut it all, then it's just like, it's a bring it down, then you got to fix the walls behind it, probably. Then you got to put new cabinets in, then you got to put your counter, you know, all this. You know, what's the time savings that you can do? Maybe you put an insert, a tile insert, granite insert in the bathrooms versus tiling the entire bathroom, right? The kitchen, can you paint the cabinets instead of demoing it all and taking it all out and putting new stuff in? And everything I'm focused on right now is what is the time frame? Because you want to try to get it on the market as quickly as possible. And it didn't matter as much six months ago, right? You feel like you were confident that the market at least can be stabilized. Maybe it'll go up a little bit. Right now, surprisingly, I saw Ryan Lundquist number like the market was down three percent December, and you know what that you know transitions into what's going to happen in the spring. Time will tell. Um, but anyways, time one hundred percent is the biggest factor. And um, one thing I'll add too: not every flip has to be a full gut job, right? Like I think at least for me, like coming into it, it's like you want to make it your own. Like you want it to be nice and pretty everywhere, but you can over improve in a neighborhood by doing that. You can, it's not about us, right? It's about the person that's buying the house, the neighborhood. It's, you don't want to take it too far necessarily in all cases, right? It's not an emotional thing. And sometimes we can find ourselves getting emotional. Like what title do we want to pick out yeah. and what? <laughs> Like pick something and stick with it, right? Something that Bobby had in place was it's the same paint colors, same tile, same carpet, right? What do people like? Build a model around that and then just duplicate it, right? You're gonna spend so much time redecorating everything. Unless you're doing like a higher end home, like an East Sac home, or you're doing something where that end user wants a little more customization, that's when you maybe spend more time on it, but otherwise, is materials a factor 
of being back ordered or anything like that for those stores. That's only windows. Windows is it. And it, it's like retrofit versus, you know, you could reframe a window, but that's going to be a lot more. But in general, like I order windows from HD Supply. You can get them at Home Depot too. Um, HD, I think Home Depot bought HD Supply <laughs> or whatever. Um, anyways, like they, uh, from my experience, has been the cheapest and they'll come in maybe three to four weeks. And it kind of depends on how custom maybe that window can be. Um, everything else, like it's in stock, like unless you're doing something special. But, you know, for the most part, you know, I create a system, a template of like, hey, we're going to do this. And then maybe there's a couple tiles we'll switch out or the floors that are in stock, right? The floor, the consistent floor that we've used, you know, comes and goes. Some of the tiles, they come and go. Your white cabinets, your fixtures, all that stuff. Like garage doors was one thing. Maybe another thing that I noticed was on back order. I heard the builders were having issues with it too. How long was that? Uh, two weeks, three weeks. But it's one of those things like you get to the end, like, oh yeah, the garage door. <laughs> and they're like, it's two weeks out. I'm like, no. And you know, you're trying to build more in a week. In the past, you know, that was something that could be pretty quickly. Appliances were another, you know, this isn't as relevant right now, but it depends where you order from. You go to Home Depot, it's probably a month or three weeks. Best Buy, I started using Best Buy consistently. They'll get you appliances in like a week, right? But it's crazy how expensive appliances got. Like they've gone up, like they're one of the, probably the highest percent that we've seen during uh, this, you know, inflation period. Bonnie, how far back do you have houses that you invest? They're like, for pumps, 90 days. Yeah. Tell me about your house. Age of house. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, because I'm getting burned a little bit on this East Sac one or whatever. And I've done, you know, I've done downtown ones, East Sac. My house is 100 something years old. I live in Curtis Park area. I definitely want to have newer homes because the old one you have like the knob and tube wiring now you know fixing this criteria right like what is your cookie cutter home like i have this house that uh chris actually helped me get it was a three two in east sacramento like 1300 square feet and at the time palms were 750 800 and there were suggestions at 800 and then you know now we're at 725 or something like that dropped at 75,000, and that's not your traditional buyer Right. So those older homes often come in expensive areas because people like the character of the homes. So, you know, a seven hundred thousand dollar buyer at six or seven percent interest rate, you know, a small family, do they want to spend five thousand ish dollars a month, six thousand a month? Probably not. So like the cookie cutter three twos that are in the Rosemonts and I don't know, West Sax or you know, Fair Oaks, Carmichael type thing, kind of looking for. Where is your bigger buyer pool going is kind of uh, a strategy for sure. That's, I think, more important to analyze it. Because the old ones, you know, you're, you're piping. And the other thing, old houses. It's also because of interest rates, too, right? Interest yeah. rates for somebody buying a $600,000 home, <laughs> and a $400,000 home, it's drastically different, right? So yeah. the buyer pool, like you said, is way bigger in that entry level market than it is in the higher end homes. The, the last thing on the, the, the older homes is plaster. Right. If any of you guys have worked on homes with plaster, like it is, it crumbles when you touch it. And it's really hard to match texture. And there's only a handful of people, I mean, I've been doing it a while, but you know, there's people that do it. But one, it's more expensive than texture. Two, it's, you know, it's hard. A lot of people don't even want to touch it, right? Like cutting in an HVAC and, you know, things just crumbling around. Like our house is, is a lap of plaster. So it can be really uh, challenging to do homes like that because there's a lot more cost. No one you know, you guys are looking at the values, especially after you do the remodel compared to what's already out there. You know, like if there's a house sitting there, that's obviously not a beat up, but still be you can sell. What's the difference when you're looking at it? Like, uh, you know, if they're like on bigger houses, houses. Houses. So houses, so if they're selling at 350, 360, and then you can invite yourself, you know, a fresh house that you're ready to sell, what are you looking at? Like, how much do you at that point list it for? Uh, it's kind of case by case. Like I know, like the house that that you guys picked up, um, there were comps like as is. Like you could have painted it and put it on, and that's like that over improvement thing. Man, I have a perfect perfect example of this East Hack House. I mean, uh, East Street downtown. After I bought it, and you got to be careful with the squirrely designers, right? They want to get in there and open up every wall. Let's make it all new. And like, oh, it sounds cool. And then it's an old house. 
we literally could have thrown it on the market and probably made like 50 grand. We did the whole flip, you know, eight month process. This was like a year and a half ago. We made like 15 grand. Like it's tough, right? This is like the over improvement. Like right? we just sold a house in South Sac, uh, different South Sac area that we're just like, well, let's see what the market will handle as is. Like that's kind of, um, you know, the over improving part can be tough, right? So where do you, I'm figuring that out. You know, I'm definitely adjusting my strategy as, as we kind of mentioned like before, I was like, got it all, it's all new. Like I want to have this name brand that you know, I can put a good product out there and it's, it's tougher right now. Right, because once again, you got it all. Your time frame here, they so, I I don't know the perfect answer. So you're first. just adjusting to your neighborhood and your market. For sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think like something to keep in mind, like you can do. I almost feel I was thinking about this the other day because I was analyzing this original property. Man, it's like carpet and paint, like a smaller, you know, design flip. Like maybe that's coming back. It used to be a big thing ten years ago, right? But right now it's like okay, you you over improve it per se, or just do the full nine, which is cool and it's fun. But you're talking about sixty thousand or seventy thousand on that next buyer, right? And the interest rate six and a half percent. It's like what what can they afford? And what is I don't know the perfect answer. You know, more agents in here that are talking to more buyers know that better. But what are they looking for? Honestly, they're probably looking to save a couple bucks. Then oh, I got this flawless kitchen and bathroom. It's kind of a some people can afford it and some can't. I think we're in that that time in everyone's life right now where it's like we're cutting back. Like I don't need the best kitchen or I don't need the best bathroom. I don't know for sure though. That's just my, my I think thought. it also shrinks the number of deals that we can do, right? If we're only looking for full rehab gut jobs, like we're limiting ourselves when we could do say two or three others that are light fixtures, right? It, and it really is about hunting for the deal. It's the hardest part, right? Like how do you find those deals? Do you right. find that your staged houses sell faster than your not staged houses? We are not staged. Okay. I don't we stage. did one in, it was in Woodland. I didn't do it in Woodland. But <laughs> no, it's sold in Woodland. That went pretty quick. And it got, when it contract twice, I was really concerned. About, I I was 20 grand on that deal, maybe a bit more. <laughs> Big <laughs> number. You don't want to lose that. And uh, it was a whole nother hurdles of why I lost it. I thought I was going to do an ADU. And anyway, Woodland's a headache. But we didn't stage that house and we got a contract a couple of times pretty quickly. And I don't know, we staged this house in uh, North Sac and went in contract three times and everyone's canceled and disappeared. Like in theory, I, I do stage them. Like we have a good stager, she's only like 12 or 1500 bucks. So it's pretty affordable and we just kind of build it in our numbers. But she wouldn't go to Woodland, so I didn't want to stage that house. So you do find that they sell that per stage? Don't know. I would always stage my houses because it's only like twelve hours. I think so. Yeah, we we always do. Um, so I I agree. I think it helps like the vision of the yeah. buyer. I think buyers don't have vision all the time when they're going in, right? Yeah, and I think the virtual staging is worth it. Yeah, I'm not a, a big fan of that. Your price going to make the house. Price is growing. I did it like a. Citrus Heights house, where we had a number of issues, but no, I haven't really had clients who stole it. Where's the more than not gone? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't had a big problem with it, but it's getting thrown on distressed sellers. So, so distressed sellers, what are they, right? Probate trust, we're typically in a lot of cases, distress, pre foreclosures, code violations, fire damage, tack lien, tack liens, late credit card payments, notice of default. Uh, there's a lot of different things, and, and there's ways we'll show you how to get those lists of those people. Yeah, 100%. So, I mean, at the end of the day, like if you're working with a wholesaler, a realtor, or whatever it is, like the property is most likely coming from one, one of the bulletin points there. And it's, um, in, in our experience, my experience, Probates and trusts are probably about 70% of the deals that we've done, or um, when we get in a probate property, where a seller passes away, right? They didn't have a trust, it goes in a probate. And this is another thing that the courts are taking a lot longer in any scenario that you're doing these days. Evictions are clearly backed up, the probate court's backed up too. It used to be like a 60 day cycle process that um, somebody passes, they file their court, uh, they file for probate, attorney goes to the 
the process and 60 days that heir, whoever it is, will get the letters of administration. Once they get that letters of administration, they are the authorized seller. They can sign on the contract, anything like that. Technically, nobody's supposed to sign on a probate property until they have those letters of administration. So um, these properties often have deferred maintenance, right? For a number of reasons, but if someone either, it could be an unexpected thing or um, could have just lived in the house for a really long time and never went to the hurdle of you know, effort to putting their property in a trust. And then the next person in their family, whoever is claiming it, um, has to go through a process. They're, they have to hire an attorney, so about two or three percent. Sometimes the length in that whole uh, process makes them think like, man, I don't want to have to deal with the realtor or I don't want to have to deal with the market or this and that. So within those timelines, and now that it's longer, right? It used to be 60 days. Now it's anywhere from 90 to 120 days. Right. So I think the mindset of a person who just inherited a house is like, how do I get rid of this thing? Right. I don't want to 90, 120 days, whatever it is now. And then, you know, seeing the real estate markets going down and days on market are 30, 40 days or whatever. You know, there's some opportunity there probably that um, they're more willing to interact and get something, quote unquote, locked up, even though you can't technically sign anything to an investor buyer that you're building rapport with during this process. And, you know, the thing that's, you know, I used to um, really target probate properties even, you know, when I was doing more sales, because I would want to be a the probate dude, right? It's something that, you know, as, as Scott said, uh, divorce, divorce and taxes. Right. Divorce and yeah. yeah. See, yeah, you that. that's happening. Um, you know, that, that it's, it's consistent, right? Unfortunately, you know, people are always passing away and it's a sort of business that's always going to be there, right? So I was targeting probate attorneys and just, and I was wanted to provide a, a packet of like, hey, I can help you with clean out. I can help educate you on the process, you know, what the timelines are, the paperwork, you know, you have to have a, a probate uh, documents with the car forms or real estate forms that you know I'm more familiar with. So it's a niche that one has a lot of opportunity with investment, and two is always going to be a, a, a sort of business that you know is never going to go away. Uh, then we have inherited properties. You know, all these they're very likely to sell within the first 12 months. There's like a percentage of them, but you know, essentially someone just inherited this property. Are they in state? Are they local? Are they, um, you know, have the knowledge to maybe have it as a rental property? Are they able to refinance it? Do they qualify for it? So there's a lot of variables that come into place. Why probate is like the number one source of distressed properties that tend to sell to investors. Um, probate file, I mentioned, it is, becomes a public record. And this is why it's easy to obtain these records and pull lists. Uh, you can literally go down to the courthouse and pull the list of the last 30 days of probates that were filed in Sacramento County. Not all counties um, have that ability, but I know Sacramento does. And then there's other sources that we're going to get into, the tools that we use that you can pay for those lists. Um, so best practices for marketing the probates, pull the records, call them, text them, you can mail them. Uh, finding agents that sell a lot of probate deals. I know Daniel Wakasabi or something like that. He's at Lions. That guy's a tortoise for production into probate real estate. He's on all these referral partners down Lions and um, Lamb Park area. And then there's another guy, Tyler, that I connected with in Roseville. And, you know, he's doing like four probate listings a month. So it's it's a huge source. And it's, you know, a lot. some people, it's networking with attorneys. And some people, I think the Daniel guy, he's just like relentless in his approach on how he um, reaches out to you know, it, it's difficult conversations, right? Somebody passed away and you're looking to help list their property, buy their property, whatever it is. In some cases though, people are overwhelmed when this process happens, as Chad was saying, and you know, the way they're looking for help and how do I navigate through the situation that they just took on a property with who knows else what's going on, you know, emotionally. I, I think too, with a lot of these, you know, people dealing with those situations, they're not in town. Right, they're what contractors do they know? How do they even get the house ready? Right, and it's the same fear that people have when even flipping a house. Right, like how do I even approach it? What do I do? They 
people that are in those positions, they don't necessarily know the contractors. They're out of state. They're not local, right? They just want to sell the house and be done with it, right? In addition to the emotion, I think there's other things. And uh, so let's do phone number and contact stuff. I can find it. Phone number and check Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and find it. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, additionally, like, you know, I tried to say, like, the, the mental hurdle, emotional hurdle, and then it comes with the timeline, right? As we said, like, it's now taking almost four months, three months for a probate mm -hmm. court to make those decisions. You know, they want to get the ball rolling ahead of time as much as they can. So, anyways, networking with probate attorneys. So, it was a big focus on my business five, six years ago when I got into real estate as I wanted referral partners. And, you know, on average, like I'm getting one or two deals from attorneys. It can be hard to contact, but you can look up lists of Sacramento attorneys and go to their office, call them, mail campaigns, whatever it is, go to events, go to mixers, not only probate attorneys, but fiduciaries and trust officers. So those are like two pieces of the puzzle that I didn't quite understand years ago when I was really going hard on um, uh, you know, networking with probate attorneys is fiduciaries is in essence, if there's no error in some cases, or if um, maybe the person that would be um, inheriting the property once it goes through the probate process, you know, this fiduciary will be the signer. Right, so there's people that are out there that are signing as a seller, a fiduciary or a trust officer, for 20 to 30 deals a year. Like we've been trying to you know, tap into that market, but it's a huge resource that I'm not fully, you know, into yet or crack the code on it. But it's just something to keep an eye on. Once again, like that RAS, like, oh, you're a trust officer. I need to connect with you, right? Because it could be a good source for referrals. Any questions on probates? Do you have a presentation? Did you put together a presentation when you go meet with these attorneys, or do you just go and? I kind of put a flyer together. Like, you know, these are, once again, like, you know, I've done X amount of probates. My escrow officer is really familiar, familiar with the process. Um, and our thing now, like, you know, my wife and I run a, a real estate team. Chanel's in here, our, our listing agent. And, um, you know, we're kind of using a, like a concierge program, right? Like, what is that extra added benefit you can do? So if you're just going on the referral basis as an agent, it's like, hey, we can help clean it up, clean it out, you know, get it financed ready. That's the big thing. Is it a cash deal or is it finance? So I do have like a flyer that kind of goes over a number of these benefits that we can kind of help with. Not a full presentation. But um, any other questions on probate? Yeah, I mean, it's really just networking. It's building a connection relationship. In some cases, having a go-to guy that kind of knows the process is not to fumble on it um, can be an important piece. So talk about pre, pre foreclosures. Uh, you know, whether this is going to become more common here or not, I'm not too sure. But so NOD, notice a default that I mentioned earlier. It's actually three months of non-payment. You don't pay your mortgage for three months. It's filed with the court public records. You can pull those lists. Um, it pops up on Zillow still, I believe. Um, what can you do? You can mail them, call them, text, door knock, and then connect to the bankruptcy attorneys. I do have one bankruptcy attorney that we work with that sends us some deals, a couple deals a year. Sometimes they need to sell immediately. Sometimes it's just a listing. Um, but certainly uh, connecting with attorneys and referral partners asset managers for banks, REO accounts, whether this is going to come back full fledged here in the next six to 12 months, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, asset manager and uh, real estate own account, the base of those are foreclosures, right? So when somebody has it, when they actually go to foreclose, an asset manager has the ability to sell the property and, and select a real estate agent, or maybe they have connections with realtors in some case, our investors that can buy like <laughs> properties. Like maybe they have five properties in Sacramento. Like, you just want to get rid of them. So that's kind of what a, an asset manager in REO is. Finding realtors on MLS. So, you know, finding, identifying realtors who specialize in something is a little easier these days, right? Like there's a listing condition on MLS that you can look up uh, realtors that specialize in probates. You can look up one specialized in 
court approved sales, often in bankruptcy, it has to be court approved. Um, you can uh, find short sales on there, REO, all those things are labeled on there. So how can this benefit you if you're just helping clients? Well, talk to those agents say, hey, I have an investor that wants to buy a property, cash, whatever, flip or whatever. And you can maybe get that property for them before it goes on the market, right? You know, if you're looking for yourself and or another investor or using us as a client. So any questions on pre foreclosures or finding kind of realtors in that category? The one thing you kind of worry about is you're stepping up that conversation. One or I can find one for you and one for your third. You buy an investor, we're closer to someone you have to be careful with. That's why you know people you know to get into a yeah, there were some laws I wouldn't have place that I don't fully understand, but essentially, like if a property forecloses, the investor does not get first dibs. Like it's like a traditional homeowner, even either that buyer, can, the owner can somehow buy it back. And Scott, maybe you know more of this than I do, but or to my understanding, like a traditional buyer will get like first dibs, but it could take like another 60 days or 45 days for the even if I want to bid, I believe if you buy it at the auction steps. Like that property can be reversed and it can go back to somebody else. I don't fully understand all the ins and outs of it. But What's, it's called civil code 2945.4. Not a fan. I don't know. <laughs> but if you do that, you break, you breach this, it's being sued by three times the mortgage for a loan amount. So they have a $200,000 loan amount, you can sue for $600,000. So there's some certain things you got to go in there with your documents, make sure they're correctly. So very careful in that conversation. It's California stuff. Yep. All right. And you have six months with big people. Yeah. And, uh, Closes somehow back, and it's only after the notice. Yeah, correct. Five, yeah, right? Yeah, before it gets together. One, one, four, five, one, four. Um, what's it? Oh, sorry. One, five, one, four. Those are all considered any of your money as a question. Or represent a question. That's the problem. The way you walk in and give them a document signed, I measure this day, then make five days later, they sign it again. Yeah. 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 Ye
Consumer confidence, buyers said this, right? What appraisal says and what a buyer's willing to pay is completely different, right? We're all trying to figure out, navigate through this tricky market right now. Any other questions on Um, Fire damage. I'm a big fan of fire damage. Probably down like six now, which is part of it. I think to some people it can be like overwhelming, daunting. I think it depends on the stage they're in too. Like if it's um charcoal and you got all the <laughs> you got all the contents in there, and you know it's just a mess. Like, like holy crap, this is overwhelming, right? You gotta clear it out, and demo it, and blah blah blah, bring it down to the studs. Like he's watching the game like writing down the address. Yeah, there is some <laughs> strategy to find those properties for sure. Um, and then there's the one, like I bought one in Natomas maybe a year ago or something like that. And it was all a restoration company came in, they cleared it out, it was down to the studs, it was clean and pretty and ready to go for me. I loved it. Um, why I like these properties and why they can be very profitable, one, in the past, right? You know, <laughs> bigger projects can often need bigger margins. Then comes in time, right? So I talked about time earlier. But the thing I like though is that insurance companies write a check to the homeowner, right? If it's a, um, a tenant property or a landlord property, not owner occupied, they're more likely to not have like emotional connection to this property. The tenant just moved out. They got this massive, overwhelming process of remodel of property they barely care about, like a cash flow to hand a couple hundred bucks or whatever. And they're like, why do I want to go through? This mess, right? So, insurance companies, when they get those restoration contractors or um, you know insurance preferred contractors or adjusters, like they can have bids for like three hundred thousand dollars or something crazy. And I've been able to complete the projects for one hundred twenty or one hundred fifty or like half fifty cents on the dollar from what the big companies call for. And the restoration companies, like it's you know crazy too you know it's all perspective right of what a company can do something for but you know demoing a house and airing it out and securing it and any type of restorations i think they're very expensive and, um so anyways the homeowner can get a check from the insurance company let's say the property's worth four hundred thousand. what if they just got a three hundred thousand dollar check from the insurance company right mm -hmm. and the only hundred thousand was what is left between that check and market value. And then the investor comes in and says, I'll pay 150 because I can do it for 150 and I can still make 100 grand. Right. So um, I do like fire damage properties because the insurance companies you know, are able to give them a big check. It's easier to negotiate the more flexible price. Instead of going on, you know, KCRA and following the news for <laughs> fires, uh, I do have friends tag me and report. It's kind of funny. They tell them, Big fan of fire problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these are emotional things. So you got to approach with caution, honestly. But there's a uh, website, firedamageproperties.com. So they will literally send you, you know, leads every month. And it could be a little grass fire in the lawn. You probably don't want to park it that one. Or it could be, you know, legit fire. And, you know, hopefully no one's, you know, injured in the uh, event. But, um, yeah, at that point, you have their information, you can mail them, call them, text them. And a lot of these lead sources, we're going to get into the tools a bit later, they don't necessarily have phone numbers or emails. You have to skip tracing. We'll go into that a bit more and how you can actually contact them. Uh, the other thing, and I kind of started a networking uh, campaign, and I said kind of because it wasn't full-fledged. You know, all these things work at the end of the day, right? But what do you spend your time on? What do you focus on? What do you go hard on, right? Networking with restoration companies. Right. And I've purchased properties where the homeowner had zero insurance. That was unfortunate for them. And I've had ones that um, they got the check from the, the, the insurance company, this restoration company did maybe the clean out, but they didn't want to go through the whole process of managing a remodel for four months. So they're like, My, might as well just get rid of it. Right. So there's some opportunity there. Driving your dollar or listening to KCRA, I guess, for um, is a way to find some other dollars. So on the fire, we need the fire check. We need to cut you. The insurance company? Yeah. I'm not as involved in that. Like it just goes to the the owner, and then they negotiate with me, and then they have. To, and literally, the insurance company gives them a check, cash in their pocket. So it could be pretty crazy. Like I had a 
an insurance claim for a water damage thing at one of my rental units, and they wrote me a check for like thirty thousand dollars. I got it done for like ten. So there's certainly like some crazy um, markups at times with those, which yeah, another topic for me. Any other questions on fire damage property? I think you can, if you're on MLS too, you can like search any of these in the descriptions. You can search probate, you can search pre foreclosure, you can search fire damage, you can search code violations. Right next door. Um, so, code violations, I picked up a few properties from these, and essentially, an owner for a number of reasons received a document from the county or the city saying, you need to fix this or you need to stop work and doing that. Remodeling without a permit. Have been caught remodeling without a permit. Uh, it's called red tag, right? In some cases, I've picked up properties from people that got red tag and the product, they were over their head with what the city required and the county required. They wanted to sell the property, right? Sometimes the property with deferred maintenance looks dilapidated, the lawn's overgrown, it can be as small as lawn overgrown and dry rod and tarp over the fence, or it can be as uh, major as, you know, uh, on some of the, the rental properties that I own, there has been have RHIP, which is rental housing inspection. Um, they've been cracking down quite a bit, I've noticed the past two years, or maybe they weren't doing as many inspections before, but they're coming in there like, if you didn't caulk your tub, like little things like that, like if you don't have the, the stopper in your sink or, um, you know, screen roll windows or anything, but there, there's very minor things that they're called, like a little rip in the carpet, like they want you to replace the entire carpet. So if you own like a carpet complex, how I got my, my 14 year deal, is like the code violation list was like four pages long. It's a laundry list and it's daunting, right? Especially this guy was a uh, he lived in the Bay Area. He's like, I don't want to deal with it. So I was able to pick up the property that way because um it's it, it, it just or... overwhelming to <laughs> I did try and be inspector, but <laughs> let him look over a few things. Yeah. Right. Carmen Acker said garage towards the house. Can we go right there? So really phone call. What they call what put in Yeah, there's you know, light bulbs or Events. like some of these things it, it sucks like the the tenant could take off you know your smoke detector because they're smoking weed in that house <laughs> so they're moving the smoke detector yeah you're getting hit for this stuff so it can be a hassle for sure so anyways real-time data all these are filed in the court again before the information anymore good on a side note is that something the tenant would call on or okay. how do they choose each property they inspect in theory, they do like uh, semi-annual inspections, like the 14 unit property. After I asked it, like, oh, you're, you're leaving alone for like three or four years. All right, cool. Um, but the tenant can complain. Um, and other than that, I'm pretty sure they they do them. I think that's a bigger problem. That was like a commercial thing, but I noticed my uh, one to four units, it, it's a different division. Like, I think they do go for a few years. So yeah, and then you have to pay for it. It's great. Yeah, but it's crazy. Like the prop, some of the properties that you buy, like you know, I first probably like Section Eight owner or something like that. Like, they're trash. I'm like, how are there no violations on this property? I'm getting hit all the time. It seems like so. It's you know, it can be challenging to keep up with it for sure. And especially you know, you can't get rid of a tenant that's in there that's you know, causing trouble and destroying the property. Any other questions on code violations? Or? Are you able to ask for less than it's worth? Yeah, yeah, I think all of them, like it's open uh, to negotiation. Um, and certainly when I've seen like the list of the violations, uh, that comes into play. And then especially like if it was a remodeling thing, and for example, like if they had an addition in the back or a garage or something like that, and they're gonna make me tear it down, like for sure. So that, and I mentioned I lost like twenty thousand dollars on that woodland deal. That was that, right? It had the owner didn't disclose their code violations. The uh, escrow company didn't identify it on the preliminary report, and they did a garage conversion. It was, it was a detached garage off an alley. I'm like, sweet, I got another unit, right? They got different <laughs> access. Like this thing's worth a million dollars. Was it so like? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the fact, you know, I'm always like, everyone's like, yeah, ADUs, California, let's have more housing. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so it was a, well, can I go to my work? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, they all know. Like, you still got to jump through your hoops. So, anyways, the pull the permit did the right thing, and it. it yeah. When I pulled the permit, they came out and they're like, whoa, this has got walls and plumbing and electrical and cabinets and a bathroom. Like, you got to tear all this out. So I literally had to bring it down to the studs after it was done. Like, everything had, I was going to do the floors and paint it. That was it. It was cool. It looked good, right? I thought, you know, I had this $100,000 asset. No, they told me to tear it down to the studs, which I wasn't aware of. So there was a couple of things. One, I got caught by the market. Two, uh, the seller didn't disclose that there was, uh, they had a violation from it. Um, so yeah, as a huge impact on what the properties were in that scenario, like you don't see wholesalers or agents or whomever like, yeah, we got this like 200 square foot extra square footage or the garage converted with plumbing or whatever it is. And that sounds good and great, but it's not if you're having a pull, if you're going to pull a permit and they come in there and they're like, rip it out. I've had two a lot of them do and that, now like from experience i'm like that's cool well, i'm not going to deal with it right you're either going to come down on price and a year and a half ago like i didn't care and, but now like you start doing things on volume and you're doing x amount of projects like you're going to get red tag one if you don't pull permit so i do pull permits on the majority of things now technically you're supposed to pull a permit if you change the language if you change your plumbing fixture if you change your window, like you know, minor things that all of us have done in our house, when you swap out an appliance, like all these things, technically you're supposed to pull a permit for. That is, people do it most of the time, no, right? So, um, yeah, it's you know, those additions and things like that certainly have a big impact on the property if they're not being done. Yes, uh, the list of code violations yep. is that public record or what it is, it? yeah. Pretty sure it's public record, but it's another, you know, almost in the tools and systems and stuff that we'll kind of get into about how to pull them. I'm pretty sure you can yeah. um, look them up online because you can look at any permit. Like you can look at my projects and one, see if I had a permit or two, see if there's a violation. So if you're looking at, and that's, I I don't know how to navigate YOLO system in Woodland. I am yeah. very familiar with the city and the county, right? And that's the other risk when you're going outside your comfort zone, right? right is you know how do i look up this information or a smaller that database probably easier. yeah yeah everything's online whereas some yeah. of the other ones you got to call and are you talking to somebody do they know what they're doing are they new everyone's shopping and hiring in the world right now um but yeah there's definitely a list of all that stuff. i'm not familiar with the violations is there like time frames where once you purchase a property you have this time to like fix it is there like late fees penalties like yeah, so there, for those of you that follow like our, some of our Instagram stuff, um, I was working with a seller that took back a horrible story to the guy. <laughs> this investor, a flipper bought a house, he didn't have insurance. Property burned down by squatters. It was like three years ago. I knew the hard money lender. He took the house back. Poor guy got stuck with his rooms of a property rumbles, right? And of course, yeah, Del Paso Heights was kind of a cool property. It was free, but anyways, the the code violations and code enforcers came and you know had to fence the property they had to uh monitor it right and this was going on for two years as one he had to go through the foreclosure process to get the house back with all the new oops you got to jump through to actually take the paper and the deed back in his name but also um you know, he got tacked on with, with years of fines for one if they have to clean up the property this is a you know an outlier situation right a big stare but um in theory i think they want you to clean it up in like six months now, if you show them progress or you're working on it or you're communicating with them they'll help you with some of the fees and stuff like that to an extent if you pull a permit that is when they will say okay someone's you know rocking and rolling on this project and you know it could be something minor it could be something big that they'll give you some time on it but in general when you pull a permit I believe it's six months, maybe nine months that you have to complete your work that you're being permitted. The violations, I'm not 100% certain like what they kind of reference on how much time you have. Um, but it is sometimes I think it's like, well, the, the, uh, the apartment that I did, I think it's like 90 days. So in theory, it's kind of a good amount of time. But in theory, sometimes it's like, you know, you're. Figuring and scheduled out with the tenants and like that 
property, it was a hassle because there were like six properties, six tenants that you needed to negotiate with. Some weren't paying. You know, there's a lot of ins and outs. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So are you pulling the permits on all these little things like light fixtures and washing? <laughs> yeah, and it's just a you know full permit, right? Like properties, I'll. It's. Five hundred and fifty dollars for a remodel permit on a oh, property. Okay. So, so you pull one permit, you say I'm updating light fixtures and outlets and general remodel and uh, plumbing fixtures and maybe I'm doing a roof, things like that. You want to try to bulk it on one. The tough thing is when you're doing big projects and you're moving walls, right? You move the walls, you're 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 moving in with design and review. And you're moving in with the planning department. So once again, we're talking about time. Um, you move that wall, and and code enforcement goes in there, and and they don't see that you pulled the permit on it. Like they're gonna kick you through the system of violations, and then they're gonna want all your plans and stuff. And the process for that one to get, a, I've I, we've kind of figured out how to draw our own plans, but you still gotta get it stamped by an engineer. Even if we do it, like maybe three to four weeks between drawing it against the engineer when you hire a designer i don't know they're like six weeks for plans and then you got the engineer like maybe another month like I don't know, maybe a two-month process and then you got to submit to the city or the county and that could be two months maybe a month right so you're talking about a three-month process so what i've done is i pulled the permit say i'm doing the general remodel permit right let's get going start down with things like that then I will either alter my permit or pull a second permit to do moving a wall or something like that, right? Because I don't want to wait three months to start swinging a hammer and start demo, which technically you're supposed to do. Um, so yeah, I, I do pull permits on pretty much everything. Pretty much. When you pull these permits, do they send somebody out and start the job and then you can get to come out at the end of the job or how does it, how does it work? Yeah, they do a well, a, it's called a rough inspection and then a final. In theory, it's not like that big of a deal, right? You, um, you know, for the rough means you demo the bathroom, right? They want to look at your plumbing before you put the walls back up, right? Um, if you're pulling down to the studs and you got wiring, kind of like this house up here, um, they want to see what's called striker plates over your wiring. So, you know, if you're doing framing and you're putting nails in, they want a striker plate between that uh, stud and the wiring just to make sure that, you know, you don't have a loose or open wire behind the wall. You know, it, in essence, it obviously is safe, precautionary, and it's good because if you're going to resell a property, there's some liability there too, right? Um, so they want to look at things before the walls are closed up and then after, right? One thing that kind of get me with some of the, the permits and can be challenging is um, you're doing, you know, you got to put GFCI outlets in, you're putting new appliances. They want all your appliances on dedicated circuits, which means your stove has got to go to the panel. Your microwave has got to go to the panel. Your fridge has got to go to the panel. Well, often these homes don't have the capacity to have that many breakers in your panel you don't get technical like electrical stuff but that's been definitely a hurdle in the kitchen it's like man how do we make room for all this and then it's like am i going gas or electric on the stove <laughs> so you know in these days um you know catch 22 there it's more expensive to run gas everybody likes gas smud california is going against gas yeah. you got a couple of different things working against you but you know all these things like as i was like i want a gas stove in my house well, now I don't want to go through the some of the hoops to jump through to you know run a gas line. I know we're talking about loading the panel up, but um, yeah, there's just some things to be mindful of when you're remodeling the kitchen and how many amps your your panel has. And generally, a panel has like 100 amps. Some have 120. Obviously, old one like 60. You know, it's best to have like a 200 amp panel. And, and um, but yeah. A 200 amp splitting from a 100 to 200 amp panel is expensive. Can be. I mean, it's uh, probably going to dump like $2,500. Yeah, I mean, that's still. It's a lot. Yeah, it's not cheap for sure, but it's. But then again, 
if you have a bunch of stuff plugged in, uh, you have to uh, put a lot of breakers in there. Exactly. Yeah, that's why kind of overload the kind of appliances. Whatever. All right, so we're all into finding deals on MLS. So MLS deals, MLS deals. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great way. It's not as heavily done now, I don't think. It's just not as much inventory, but there's definitely deals to be had out there, right? One of those ways is putting in the description when you're searching, pictures, handyman special, PLC, creative finance. I mean, there's keywords that you can put in there, and you've got to kind of play around with it. Bobby and I play around with it when we're doing it. Um, to find those listings, and you'll see them come up that are in not the best fit, right? The thing with those is, at least what I'm seeing, the prices, they're not marking them down where they should be necessarily. So you've got to write a bunch of offers. It's a numbers game, right? So create a template, get something going when you're doing that, but you want to make it to where it's repetitive and you're writing a lot of offers. I think last week we wrote, 18 18 total so it's something that you and like bobby was saying too all of these methods work it's just where do you want to spend your time doing it what do you want to dive into right if you're like us we're going to dive into all this but you also have a little more man cover right than just an individual um in those searches you know look for the ones that are back on market Right. Look for the price drops, you know, create a, a custom search inside the MLS to where you're constantly monitoring and watching what's coming up and what's going on. Right. Um, 60 days plus on market. The longer that those houses sit, the more likely are they got to come to Jesus talk <laughs> with either themselves, the realtor, whoever to know that, hey, we're probably not priced right. Right. Um, the return on that, we say it takes roughly, it's a 2% return. So if you're writing 100 offers, and you get two deals out of it. So it's a lot of work. But the way I look at it is who's, who deals with buyer agents? Like who's dealing with buyers right now? How much time do you spend dealing with a buyer? I'm working as an investor and it's a good six months. Six months. Or an investor, not an investor like that, because we don't need to walk the property. We care what the numbers look like, right? We don't care like the neighborhood necessarily, unless it's like on Bridge Street or something. Right? But even those will come. But the yeah, we're doing it strictly on map. So the same calculations of the level of fixer it is. What is it comping out at? What's the ARV on that? And then adjusting for the declining market, and then make it, you know, 50, 55, 65, 70 percent, depending on the, the type of picture that it is. And you can typically tell by looking at the pictures, right? We burn them with like 60. <laughs> and that's why you want that, that easy formula to look at it. Because if you're submitting 100 offers, 18 in a week, like, okay, 60 percent, 70 percent, 65. Go and I've got it that, that I'll email you guys it's just an offer sheet, and you just plug in what the listing price is, what the ARV is, and it will tell you what the thing is, right? You wanna make it towards a fast process. That's what we've kind of come up with making these three different levels, because it's too hard to go into each one and dive into it. You kind of want to get it in contract, then dive into it, if that makes sense. But my point is dealing with buyers, like how much time driving around, finding a house, getting the client. Like how do you get the how do you get the client? You're doing open houses, you're putting signs out, you're sitting in an open house for three hours, right? Finding deals on the MLS and doing it this way helps you as a realtor also work with somebody like us or ourselves, right? Or maybe you want a JV with us or somebody else where you partner on the deal, right? It's the opportunity to earn multiple commissions. To me, it's like, and I talked to Bobby about this, it's like a no-brainer. Like if I was just starting real estate or just doing real estate in general, I would—I don't even know if I deal with regular people. I know it sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get that big house and wherever that. Permade house, I like that. 
Yeah, that was on MLS. And that was kind of, you know, it's random things sometimes how I have purchase deals in MLS the past few years. It was only recently where I'm like, all right, maybe we should put a whole strategy and game plan like this. Let's make, attack this like a bit, you know, 100 offers, maybe 2% return. And we've heard from others in the industry like that, of course. That particular house it was in my neighborhood. I kind of talked to her at the beginning. How did you talk to her? Um, I have my, I have my six month old on my chest. <laughs> so he helped. He was it's sweet. Talk talk he's doing the yeah. guy. And that kind of helped me build the force. You got to bring a baby. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bring a baby. That's step one. Step two. Um, well, really what what on. The house went penning. And I think the point of this is like, okay, you make that offer. They're not going to accept it right away. They're going to go with someone else. It, you know, chances are it may not work out. And then that, Scenario like I swooped in, I was like, they didn't want to go back and what happened with the first offer? Crazy. What'd she tell you? No, yeah, she said no. <laughs> I made the offer, she said no. You know, can you come up to this price? I said no. I said, okay, we're gonna go with this other car. I said, okay, cool. But then what did you do after that? Just followed up with her, checked in, and then a week later, she's like, all right, we'll take your are you good to go on your original offer? And she had a report, oh, she's like, no, I'm gonna, I want 10,000 less. So I got pretty good deal on it and closed. And the seller was out of state. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So on the MLS, how much on the US did you figure out? That one? They started at 825. They bought it for five. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Although that, you know, that's an outlier. You know, that was, I don't know if it was like an artistic house and, you know, it was a great neighborhood and really cool features. <laughs> but, you know, some people, it's hard to see past. A design or a funky floor plan or whatever it is right so and i think also like that one got somewhat lucky that it was um you know it was insane right they had it on all the news channels so they did an open house there's 300 people going through so, like did they want to go back on the market and deal with that or just deal with somebody and i and i sent them my resume I'm like hey man like i just did this esac house and this old woodland house like i did I did an addition on, on my house in the attic. So I'm like, I'm used to old houses. I can take on big projects. Like I have this track record. Like it kind of helps have that stamp of approval. Like, hey, you know, I'm gonna perform. Let's let's end this thing, wrap it up for, you know, get some closure for the for the family. And that was a probate thing. And I think that's like that situation, you know, it's a huge success story in that. And it's you know, that's a drastic reduction from what they listed regularly but there's deals like that all over the place right. and it's just how do you just how do you put the systems in place to follow up with them make the call build the report right building the report i think is like the most important thing like don't send them a text message pick up the damn phone call them like talk to them like you're talking to one of your friends right don't just go straight into price <laughs> like if you guys take two hundred thousand dollars less I'm an investor. I want to flip a house. You're going to be like, go kick off. Right? And, and I think that's the other thing, like providing an offer in hand, right? Compared to like a verbal or a text. And I think that was an aha that we had. Like, there are tons of deals that they're not selling. They've raised their hand, they put it on MLS, but they're not getting that uh, price that they're asking, right? They're coming down, coming down, coming down. And I'd start seeing friends or other flippers, and I'm like, holy crap, they just got it for that. Like, and I, we didn't follow up. That's why we're. The follow the follow up I think is key, and that's a bad deal. A perfect example of following up, building rapport, using a baby to your advantage. Yeah, uh, uh, the baby. Okay. They're really different. He's older now. You might not be as cute. So I think that's you know as you're as you're out there hunting for deals like that, keep that in mind. Like keep a spreadsheet, follow up, have systems in place. Don't just like do it once and then forget about it. You're never going to be successful. Uh, quick question: How do you guys the whole career? How many deals do you guys find that uh, you guys find the owner that's going to over finance the house? Uh, we just uh, it's far more common like right now. If we just sold a property downtown that he was going to do seller financing, I've been talking to more off market sellers because you know it's tough to get that 50 55 percent ARV right now. It really is, and if you're going to go buy a property with the 10 percent hard money loan and the interest and the Famous and stuff like that. So, anyways, like having those conversations with the sellers, it's much more common right now. 
Maybe that's a whole nother thing. Like I got some information on podcasts and people to follow in communities with Pace Morby. Yeah. He doesn't want to write him down. Yeah. He does sub two. He's like the king of subject to financing, right? And he's creative financing king. I just saw him in Vegas at a convention. And he would definitely be someone to follow because there's a lot of opportunities right now on MLS. You could search on MLS in the description, creative financing, private finance, something like that. So I've only done one. I did one subject two, and um, oh, I did two actually. But one was like a hard money loan, huh? Oh, no, no, like me actually, like purchased the properties. Like one was a traditional seller, one was a flipper, and he got a code violation. He was over his head, took over his hard money payments because it was a little more favorable than you know going through the whole cycle of escrow and things like that and paying all those fees again. So those are things that are opportunities for sure, but not many. But I'm going to start. What about the uh, apartment complex you're talking about? Is that you just did a traditional loan for that? And then you put yeah, it? yeah, that was a deal. Like I <laughs> created financing in theory. Like I cash out. This was before rates got really oh, hairy. Oh. I did a cash out refi on a property, and then we did a HELOC on our house, and then we had some cash in our pocket. And we, I, every other deal I've done, I've had limited money in. That deal, we did put a big chunk down. And um, I tried to do seller financing with that guy. Probably if I would have been a pace more of his class, he got some scripts down, like I probably could have closed them. Like the husband was on board, the wife wasn't, and I kind of just let it be. And it probably would have been way more favorable and beneficial for them and me to do seller financing. And uh, it didn't work out, but definitely mm -hmm. an opportunity. Anything else on MLS deals want to cover? My point in that though is it's uh it's a viable place. And it's super easy to access. Paying for lists and doing the other stuff, it is it takes more too and some money, right? As realtors, you're already paying the fee for them. Because yeah, I was yeah. like not even thinking about buying on the MLS because it's overpriced yeah. for investors. But you're finding that you have success. Yeah, yeah. Look, look for the ones that are on the market longer that have been saved. Well, yeah. The ones that need some love, right? Like someone coming in to buy a house, is going to buy a house. Oh, it smells like cat piss and <laughs> carpet. That's and, a favorite. Right? Yeah. If somebody like us, if I was moving in, I'd be like, this is easy. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, Bobby and I had a conversation about buyers. Like, buyers are like, I don't like a carpet color. Put new carpet in. Yeah. You don't like the carpet color. It's a house. Who cares? It, so, but people, they don't want to put that work in or they're fearful of it. They don't understand it. They don't know. They just don't know. And I, and I think I've been the same way. Like on average, I've only bought like one deal. Like all these methods that we're going over, I probably have like one or two, a couple methods from each of them, right? Or a couple deals a year from each. And I've only bought like one deal a year on MLS in the past few years. But now it's like, all right. I'm seeing that there's way more opportunity. And I'm like, we got to put together a game plan and a strategy, uh, create a system on it, you know, put everybody in a database. We're putting realtors listings in databases and like, all right, let's follow the news. Right, create a system on it. And then it'll be fruitful. And you write what, maybe eight offers a week on MLS? No, we were at 18 months. Oh, um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, nice. we're getting our numbers up. Yeah. It's on our plan is real, I think, 25. Yeah, because I mean, you know, we're trying to do, you know, 40 deals this year. So it involves obviously more avenues of business. In MLS, there, there are tons of opportunities. So yeah, for everybody in here, like you find a deal on MLS, like we're open to having you represent us. Well, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So All right, so we're gonna get into tools that we use. Um, so batch leads or prop stream is how we pull lists, right? And in that list, all those code enforcements, not the fire damage on separate, but probates, um, evictions, things like that, you can pull, so excuse me, batch leads, you can pull non-owner occupied information, absentees, tax liens, you can pull data that's not real time, right? You can pull old probates and old inheritance, foreclosures daily is the one that pulls real-time info. So literally people are um, filing probate today. That information will pop up in this uh, system that I use like the next day. So we pull every two weeks and foreclosures daily and we pull in their evictions, we pull code violations and we pull probates. 
because those are times of their money. Match needs will pull, um, as I said, non owner occupied, right? They've been owning the property for a while. They're absentee, they're out of the area. Um, maybe they have a tax lien. Maybe they got a notice of default. We'll pull all that list together and we'll stack that list. So you can cross reference those various indicators, which will give them a higher probability of selling, right? Everything kind of increases the chance. Of them wanted. So batch leads, I like the system. You can skip trace it in there. It's about 10 cents, maybe a lead. But how do you pull a list of a thousand people? You'll get a hundred um, hits most likely. Not a hundred, sorry, it'll cost you it'll cost you a hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, do you want to just mail them? Do you want to call them or text them? Whatever you want to do there. I'll use Mojo Dialer for cold calling. I will say to to rewind, like don't just do one. So don't, I wouldn't say just call them or just go and knock them or just mail them, right? I would go after it in, in multiple different ways if you're, if you're focusing on that. Yeah, staying in front of them for sure. And you can pull, you know, wide list or doing a shotgun approach or you're doing that niche list that you can have less people and you get really targeted on them. Obviously good for listings and for investment properties because you're dealing with variation of distress situations. So you find batch leads the best because there's many different. Right, yeah. Uh, the best, I haven't used a ton. I like them. They're pretty user friendly. It's crazy all the information you can see on somebody. Okay, like, so it's not like it's that much better than any of the other. I think they're comparable. Prop stream is very popular. Batch leads is popular. Yeah, I just, I use batch property, leads. What about property radar? Um, I, I used property radar like six years ago. I just, I don't know. I, for whatever reason, I just kind of guys I know that fly strictly on the courthouse and go about it that way. Right. That's right. what they're using. Right. Yeah. They're not using batch leads or prop stream. Yeah. And you can I, I do my mail campaigns for the batch leads. It's like 40, 50 cents a mailer. Um, How much would you say your tech stack costs me all these? Like all these things technology. that are technology. technology. Uh, I, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, batch leads is like a hundred dollars a month. I think they went up. They used to be like fifty. Um, when I'm, and so with that, right, you could pull. I think it's like ten thousand leads a month in batch leads. So that's a lot, right? Um, non non owner occupied, absentee, blah blah blah. I and mean, then you could condense it down. Three foreclosures that are non owner occupied and just did an eviction and have a federal tax lien, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, stack it all together. Um, foreclosures daily is more expensive. I just paid for it. Well, I don't know. They make you do annual or semi-annual and you save a little money. It's probably about 120 a month, right? And I know there's different sources. Like I used to get probate information specifically from a probate, you know, website and it was $300 and they gave you you know, all the leads skip trades. I've been pulling it from foreclosures daily, and then I have the evictions, the probates, the inheritance, all this stuff, and then I'll skip trace it, right? And what I do like about that, right, is I'm seeing attorneys, right? I'm like, I have a list of all the attorneys from the past like 12 months, and they're on a mail campaign. Like, I used to call them a lot, but um, you, you could see the ones that are doing more deals, right? Like, oh, this dude's doing. 30 probates in a year. Obviously, that's someone I want to try to network with. Yeah, so that you can identify like patterns, right? Same with evictions or whatever. Um, so back to your question. Uh, so uh, skip tracing, let's say you pull a thousand names, it's a hundred dollars plus your list for batch leads, a hundred dollars, that's two hundred dollars. Mojo dialer, I think, is $150. Um, who here wants to cold call? It's super popular and fun. <laughs> uh, if you do cold calling, you definitely want to do a single dialer instead of three. There are like a lot of TCPA, which is spamming people that used to be able to like go gangbusters and three, five dialers at a time and you know call all these people, and now they're cutting down a lot of the robo dialing. Um, so you gotta do one at a time, is would be my recommendation. Does that answer your question? Any yeah. clarity yeah. on that? Yeah. I mean, I roughly spend about Fifteen hundred bucks on those different campaigns, not including mail. 
Upstream, I don't I think know. it's close to the same price. Yeah, yeah. I think the yeah. trees is about yeah. the same. Um, I'm looking forward. The Old Machine's a cool um, app. So if anybody's doing driving for an hour, once again, it's kind of that sniper approach versus shotgun where you're driving in the area and you're, you're working on a project and you know, South Sac Airport or whatever, and you're seeing houses that are distressed, like, oh shoot, I went to go look at a property on Friday. There's like three houses, tarps, and uh, you know, you see the red tag of the code violation, you see this and that. Like, oh man, I, you know, writing down the address, putting them in a database and systematically following up with them one way or another, right? Doesn't mean they're gonna sell today. But it's six, 12 months, three months, whatever it is. Um, but Geo Machine allows you to take a picture, it loads all the information in the app, and you can right there skip trace it for like five or 10 cents, 10 cents maybe. And then you see their information. You can text them right there, you can call them right there, you can mail them. And boom, I just rolled by this house and I can mail them, text them, and call them right there, as Chad was saying, do all three. And that's that sniper approach versus the shotgun approach. And I think that goes back to like the beginning where we're talking about when you're aware of something. Like as you drive around now, pay attention. They're everywhere. It's absolutely insane. Unless you're in like full or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but they're everywhere, man. There's distressed properties everywhere. It's insane. Yeah. Well, for, for our case, right? That house is for you know, the neighbor. Yeah, we have one friend's approach. Like, well, how would you do that? He doesn't know anything. He's like, renting it. So, well, you're not going to approach him, you approach the, the, the owner, right? Yeah. That's what the call is. I mean, there's a way you can uh, my mypeoplesearch.com. Oh, yeah, they does have. Yeah, she has access. Yeah, Harvard, yeah. But you can, if you look up mypeoplesearch.com, one of our buyers' agents, like, he was like, a assassin at finding people. Like, he had people out there, he had people come to his open house and knew that her name was Jane and lived on, like, Whatever, well, ABC Street, and uh, it was like a, it was on the other street. He's looking up everybody that he could find. Oh, there's Jane, cool. But his dad, like, holy crap. Like, my people search, I think it's that one. Like, there's a few different, it's creepy. And stuff, you can kind of find one other people. Like, I blocked my information. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can look up a lot of stuff on there. One thing is, how come you guys take a picture? Same thing in contact for the property profile. You put the property, take a picture of it, pull it down. The title company? Yeah, they like that for the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, yeah. That's pretty cool. Free. So if you got a job, I'm asking about it. Take a picture of the property in front of it. That's the geocode. Pull it all the contact, all your property profile stuff right there. So that's a free word. So talk to yeah. Guy. Yeah. So I, think, phone number, I think you know, all all that. I think deal machine is 100 bucks. And it's like, you know, one of those things. Maybe it's 70. It's like, man, oh, okay. it's like adding all these tech packages, obviously, can add up. Um, lastly, investor VAs or cyberbacker. This is a virtual assistant. I have a couple. Um, we got the Mohammeds in Pakistan, and we got a uh, Vanny in the Philippines, and we got, we got a guy, guy in Kenya. We got a guy in Kenya editing our videos. So yes. labor is cheap if you can find it. Or you're on Fiverr, or you're talking to one of these companies. Cyberbacker uh, is like an affiliate of Keller Williams or this guy in Utah, a team leader, created this. Philippine based company and their virtual assistant. We, investor VAs, same thing. Like they can cold call all day for you. They can just build databases. I know a lender that's having them dish out pre approvals all day. Like, not that they're doing credit background checks, but if you got that client that's hitting you up at like 7 a.m. in the morning for your pre approval, like he's got, he's got VAs like, oh, let me roll that together for you. No problem. Like around the clock. So you pay someone six bucks an hour to, you know, pump outs and things like that. You know, just, there's a number of things that you could utilize and have cheaper. Like, that's what ours does. Like, she puts all the lists together for us. She does a lot of that stuff. Marketing, kind of campaign. So the kind of that kind of yeah, the VAs for sure. And our thing right now, like we have a you know sales team and then oh, BJP, whatever, our, our company, uh, she kind of splits time between the two. So if we she would have been full time, it would have been a little better. But she helps with our Transaction coordinating. She helps um, keep track of like insurance stuff. She helps somewhat with accounting stuff, like pay, pay some bills online, um, create lists, follow up. Like we're very now like you know, having a you systematic know approach. Yeah, different campaigns. Um, you know, tracking is a huge thing. Anything you want to be successful in life, I think you got to track your numbers. You know, how many people you're talking to, and really more putting emphasis on. 
you know, how many conversations, how many, uh, you know, knowing your KPIs, right? Conversations, appointments, closings, things like that. How many people are going to talk? And no chance I would be able to track that. But team, kind of team can. Any questions on tools that we use? List stacking, kind of went over that. Um, once again, like you can cross stack all of the all these various things, a couple more ideas, the hairy properties, water shutoffs, non-owner occupies, and just have a very niche list. Kind of talk about driving for dollars too. Anything you want to add on that? I think, you know, just um, signs of neglect, right? Tarp roofs, ported up windows. Yeah, for the overgrown lawns and extra cars and junk out front. Spirit alone, and they're roof. rolling through Vegas in the desert looking for houses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The old machine is a good, quick way for you guys as you're driving around to snap a picture, get the information. Keep it organized, right? Because they, they, I think they automatically put it in a CRM, right? Otherwise, you gotta drag and click on Google Sheets. Are you guys even looking at stuff for out of state at this point, or just currently in your area and keeping it local? Um, I've inquired on the stuff like for rentals but not flips yeah i mean i know a lot of people do some wholesaling or flipping like out of state but especially right now like i've been here using the bigger flippers that were doing all this stuff you know because you want to you know go deep in your market not wide especially right now like you don't fully understand other markets yeah like cash flow and things like that for rental properties could be a different scenario but What's um, your take or your guys' takes on rentals versus Airbnbs? Airbnb is getting pretty saturated right now. It's kind of a common theme I've been hearing. So it's like better perform. I think there's going to be some inventory coming on for people that can't uh, hold on to them. I've heard about people foreclosing because they're doing these, these DSCR loans, debt okay. service coverage ratio loans out of a hard money loan that they just can't even pay for it. I have one Airbnb and put it more like a midterm rental. And I've been just wanting to put it back on a long term or to sell it. Um, so that's kind of my perspective. I think, you know, it's it, how much time do you have, right? If you can manage and do whatever and change whoever is creating a system for it, right? Who do you, who's doing the sheets? Who's going to store or shampoo and who's doing the tiles and things like that? Like you just, you're running a hotel, right? Like it's not. I think once you have like five, 10, or 15, like you can scale it, but it's hard to scale like a couple. Um, I'd be very cautious. You know, flipping, be very cautious with flipping right now, right? Uh, Airbnb, very cautious. Like I think you know, a lot of people aren't traveling to Sacramento, but people come here for odd reasons, I realize. Like, you know, I have a property in North Oak Park, and they, you know, they're just visiting family or they have maybe a patient. Like their family of a patient in the hospital. Like a lot of people always say, like, oh, it's a traveling nurse. No, it's like it was never a traveling nurse. More often it's a family member of a patient or just somebody that sold their house or whatever kind of random stuff. Um, we kind of talked about this, like the real-time list. I already done it. That's my son. He's, he's a little Benjamin Button kid when he was like, 10 years old. He got all wrinkles. He grew out all the wrinkles, unfortunately. It's that very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> so referral partners, I think that's you know, that's a huge thing in our business, right? Whether you're a mom or a realtor, investor, flipper, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, building those relationships with people is huge, right? So hard money lenders, restoration companies like Bobby was talking about, contractors, insurance agents, fellow realtors, wholesalers, board attorneys, bankruptcy, bankruptcy attorneys, you know, um, really connecting with people, rubbing elbows with them, and building relationships with them, right? Thursday, we're holding a, an investor meetup, happy hour over at Shima's across the street on Thursday at 5.30, if you guys want to come. Um, same thing, right? Putting yourself out in front of people, meeting people, meeting wholesalers, realtors, wholesalers. I think we didn't talk much about that, but it's a viable place. And buyers too, too, like too. yeah, yeah, I mean, buyers, yeah. We're looking for deals at all times. Like people, you can meet at different networking events. Like people have different criteria too. Like you know, 
people are going to form their target price to buy differently. If someone's buying cash and they're a contractor, they're not going to have the same formula like us, right? If they're not doing hard money or this and that, right? There's always good opportunities to network and um, certainly meeting as many people as you best that. Yeah. So a recap, MLS, Craigslist, Zillow, Fizbo's, right? Pay-per-click, SEO, Facebook ads. The point of showing this is driving for dollars. No, it, it all works. You just got to pick something and get after it, right? I don't suggest taking all of this and just doing it all. <laughs> you'll lose your mind and you'll fail. Pick one, get really good at it master it right and then start to scale add another tool after that add another tool after that ultimately maybe add a va from Philippines or pakistan <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, hey i'm telling you I, the, the, the muhammad brothers are, are the smartest dudes ever right i mean that's so there, there's a ton of solutions for you out there right um it's really just applying, but I, I'd say pick one, stick to the one, go hunt that way, spend a lot of time on it, right? None of these things are going to happen to you spending 10 minutes there. Like Bobby and I are literally in the office, and so you either see us in here, we're sitting in there all day. But we're hunting all day, making calls or driving around. Yesterday, both of us, like, even with the one girl, like, they're feeling me. So you're always, always hunting, right? So pick something and then just stick with it and then add to it. You guys are also welcome to call us if you guys have any questions or need direction or thinking about doing something or you're just like, don't exactly know how to approach it. Reach out to us and we'll help you. We are you should just drive for some things. No, I've heard about that. I was like, the driver dollars, yeah, talk to Amazon. Talk to you. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Good, good. stuff. Yeah. That's kind of a good idea. <laughs> that. You know, where do you learn and where do you build this network of people, right? You know, the figure pop, pockets podcast, seven figure flipper, wealthy investor, get creative. There's some really good ones out there. Go follow those guys on Instagram as well. I mean, they'll spit a ton of good knowledge for you. There's also coaching groups within those. You know, Bobby and I are both in seven figure flipper. So there's, you know, whether it's Peyton Morby or Ryan Panetta or any of these guys, they have coaching groups. That might be a way to start and they have different levels that you can get into. So you don't have to get into like a full-fledged, like say one that Bobby and I are in, but you can get into like a beginner level, right? That doesn't cost as much money. Bigger groups of people, um, a lot of online content, but that stuff will help. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, in coaching. I've been in coaching for... The last decade and it, it'll definitely fast forward you from a to z way faster than if you try to do it on your on your own because you're going to fail way more than you, like way more times right so coaching to me is i think a big thing especially something like this where it's always learning and evolving it also in coaching brings together a group of people all dealing with the same thing all on the ground doing the same thing Right, and so you can start to see patterns and things that are happening within the market a little sooner than if you didn't have that group of people, and then you can pivot and adjust on how your strategy or what your strategy is, which we've done multiple times since September. Right, um, networking. So go to meetups. You can go to what's the website? Bob's on the uh, meetup.com. Meet yeah. meet There's one com. tonight in Roseville with David Cooper is hosting. He's on that one's at Kirby. 30, 30 or I'll be at that one. And then there's one, the one we're doing on Thursday, and then uh Surrey have one in West Sac, uh Chicken Mule. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I haven't done that one yet. But yeah, meetup.com, like you can find a bunch of them. And I think like figure out the format, like ours that we're gonna host this Thursday, those of you that are coming, like really just gonna kind of connect and network. And I think like you'll check out some of these other ones, and it's probably more educational. Maybe they do panels or speakers and there's a little bit of networking. Like we're feeling it out. Um, it's going to be more mixer type networking where people just kind of mix and mingle with folks and we'll probably do some more educational baseball in the future. Uh, at least for this one. 
And we're still, you know, for us, this is whether it's teaching this class or doing the mixer. Bobby and I have both hosted a ton of mixers, but not specific to real estate investing and flipping and yeah, building those relationships. So that's new for us. And we're trying to figure out what, you know, format we want to do. We want to hang out because we had gone to one in Roseville and it was strictly like a classroom setting similar to this. They had a speaker flying from Utah. It was really good, but you didn't really get to, unless you're staying really late, <laughs> hang out with everybody. So it was like nine o'clock when they started networking. I was like, I gotta go home. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, we want to do the opposite of that, at least for this first one, and then kind of feel it out. Like alternate, some, right? Get some like feedback. Yeah. Mixer and then have more of a education. educational type one to educate people. So we'll play it by ear, but we're going to do them every month. So look out for that. Good question for you. Uh, you mentioned you uh, work and uh, do you live in California, Arizona, Illinois? Carolina? I live here in California. Here uh, in California. Okay, yeah. and you just you work uh, out, out there. Yeah, but what happened with that is I, I ended up taking over an account for Blackstone and an invitation home. And then in that, we did a test case here in Sacramento where we were essentially reselling, repairing the houses and reselling to the renters that rented that house. We called it the Resident First Book Program. Their team was based out of Dallas. And so we would, I'd be on a call with them for an hour a day. We ran that program for six months. Ultimately, that then expanded into Southern California, down to Phoenix, um, Chicago, almost all of Florida, but their headquarters were in Tampa. And so then I was in charge of building those teams around the country and then managing that portfolio from the outside. And the same portfolio was a buy out based. Uh, Kind of the same. Well, in that case, it was a little bit different, right? Because they were they were buying and holding. They actually originally bought to flip, and then if, if anybody was around in 2012, they spiked. They single-handedly, one hedge fund spiked the market by 20 percent a year by itself. If you were like us and going to the courthouse to buy a house in 2012, you weren't going to get the house. They were going to outbid you. They had an app on their iPads and they could punch in the address and it would tell them what they could go up to. And they were typically bidding about 10% higher than what everybody else was. So they were buying everything. Then they were hiring realtors. So they would hire like a Bobby to go out and buy anything. Unlimited money. It was insane. And so it was dry. They were picking everything up, which then what increased the demand, right? Because it was harder to get stuff. And they were overbidding on the properties. And then their strategy, you know, their strategy changed. Now it's the largest holder of single family homes in the United States. And they ended up acquiring another company. I think it's worth probably forty billion dollars. Maybe it's more now. It's a, it's an insane amount. And so that program was designed to obviously sell the house back. And what I didn't know at the time was it was to show how could you could how you could reduce friction costs. Friction costs in selling a house is like the repairs, realtor fees, costs. How could we go directly to the person living there and then bring those costs down, eliminating things in the middle to reduce friction costs, therefore increasing the value of the portfolio. So if it was valued at say 15 billion, then we could show that it's worth 17 billion by using this method. It then increased the stock price when they went public. Which is what that program yeah. essentially was. What did my picture of They would do it all. They did not. Uh, they didn't care. So they, you guys were now. No, they're not. They're not buying now. They a lot of hedge funds. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Orders scaled back. Yeah. Like Zillow's gone. Red in. There's a select. Yeah. Few. Yeah. Those guys won't. Those guys will Yeah. Chad, so uh, what are you guys looking to get out of this? Are you investors? I mean, what's your motive? Hey, both Bobby and you are. <laughs> you know, both of us have a, a, you know, come from a place of contribution to everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> we want to save the people. You have any uh, sellers out there that yeah, can't sell their property? 
And how do you do that, right? So how do you build a relationship like we're starting today with some of you guys? Maybe we already have relationships with, right? But we want to get back. We want to teach others by empowering you guys to do more. It helps us to do better too, right? Not all of you guys are going to want to go tackle a fire damaged house. It's too much. Not the experience, right? Like maybe you want to tackle something else, but it's like, if you have that deal, bring it to us. We'll tackle it. Bobby does not care. I think just educate people too. Like there's a lot of people that have, you know, interests in this industry and you know, there's there's a lot of information out there, you know, love to be like a resource and also just build our own community, build our own network, right? As we're doing like this, this investor meetup, like I feel like I haven't really plugged in for the six years that I've been doing it. I've been stumbling along the way. And I've had Keller Williams, you know, the license agent here. And there's always been that culture and community here. That's why I joined one of those groups because it is a sense of community and you're able to like mastermind and network with people, right? Well, I haven't had that with investing. I literally joined, joined the group in September and I'm like, you know, let's bring some of this, you know, local, start like our own meetup. We could go to others, but I'm like, rather keep it our own backyard and, you know, make the rules or whatnot and be able to kind of connect and meet with people. And there's always deals, you know, floating around that I've done with people in this office. I've you know, you never know if somebody's got some money they want to invest or there's a contractor they're trying to connect with. So I think just, you know, connect with people, educate people, and, you know, for us all to, one way or another, enhance our real estate portfolio, investing strategies, and learn from each other. And I'll compliment Bobby Peters, who's been friends for quite some time. We're not the same brokers, but I can still give him a call because a lot of areas that, you know, has expertise in. That I'll still call him on, you know, and he's he's something so she's kind of a smart uh, guy. Try to be resourceful. I've done I've dealt with you know hundreds of squirrely things and you know just traditional, you know, I used to do tons of traditional transactions and now really focused on flips and stuff. And there's a lot of hairy situations and there's not as many people that kind of connect with them. And I would like to give you that. Like, him on the house, so <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah and yeah the, the flip properties are always really good open houses because neighbors have been watching them and seeing the progress and progression and it's finally this nice property on the block that and have a new family and um you know it's a good opportunity to meet the neighbors for sure we have to another class for right? this one i'm we're doing some classes on the bird strategy and i was trying to like Feel, you know, it's, this is new, right? Like I started teaching classes maybe six or nine months ago and kind of feel it out what people, um, what information people want. The other class that I've been teaching, you know, to a lot of uh, realtors is like, like, man, like we want to own property. So in 20, 30, 10 years, five years, whatever, that we have a portfolio that we can lean on for maybe retirement or something. So, you know, I through a lot of these techniques I've been finding properties and then keeping them as rentals. So we're doing a couple classes on the burst strategy, which is buy, rehab, refinance, rent out, repeat, bunch of R's there. <laughs> um, and Scott's helped me uh, lining one up uh, downtown MLS, which is in Curtis Park. And then uh, we're doing one at the Natomas office. And then we did one at SAR. So certainly in, we did a class at this office in Oak Grove. So um, yeah, it's gonna get feedback like, you know, I think some of you may have been to that other class. I don't know if anybody got that. Anyways, the bird class versus like this one, hunting for deal, just kind of different, you know, uh, knowledge there and topics to enhance your real estate knowledge. Yeah. I have a question. I have some, um, for someone who's wanting to invest and he is, he is house rich, but cash poor at the moment, but he wants to get that it's so bad. Yep. What? You, that, you know, that's what I did with, uh, and I, you know, I wish I had done it earlier, maybe. Um, I pulled a HELOC out of my primary residence, right? The interest rates aren't great right now because they've gone up. I got it at 4%, it's up to 7 but I borrow money at 10%. I pay people 12% only money, right? So I'm going to get a HELOC at 7 without the points and fees. Like, we're hard money lenders. Well, if you get a loan, it's not cheap. You got to pay like a couple points, you know, just like a commission, right? And then you got to pay your 10% or 11% or like I said, I pay 12% to a private investor that I work with. And he's, you know, he's wham, bam, easy, done deal, no problem. So anyways, he can get a HELOC. One of the companies that I used was First Tech Credit Union. Golden One's good at 
HELOCs, all the lenders in here, I'm sure they knew someone for HELOCs, but you know, it's interest only payments and we leveraged our primary residence to buy a 14 unit property because I saw the value. And even with that HELOC, I was able to break even for the time being until I stabilized it, right? When you buy a property, multifamily, maybe the rents are low and in the future, you're gonna increase the rent. So. Um, or pull the money out. Uh, Andre in his office has like a three or four hundred thousand dollar HELOC on his house that he buys properties with, right? And you're buying as cash, and you can buy it in five days or three days or whatever you want to do, and then you have more control, and you don't have to wait on underwriting and processing or another decision maker. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities there. The rates were three percent, right? It was a lot better. And you know, can I leverage that three percent money and and buy this uh, fixer multifamily property for my portfolio? And that's what I did. I I'm a big proponent of leveraging. You know, I do have a decent amount of equity with the properties that I've accumulated over the years. And now I'm like, how do I tap into those? And push that money over here, right? I'm okay breaking even over here and adding more assets to my portfolio. So that's that's a lot of the the different strategies I'm kind of covering and. And going over in that bird class, like get creative. Like, who do you know that has that HELOC? Hey, I can find the deals. You got the HELOC. Let's go in this together. Right. So there's definitely some opportunities. There. And the thing with the hard money, you only need in most cases 10% down the purchase price. That's what he doesn't have so the cash for the so that's where he does the HELOC and okay. pulls out well, a down payment then, from that. He needs to, um well, in his case, his case, the issue too is that he is in construction and then he wants to do this and he starts going to work, to work for the construction so he doesn't have an income as part of it. Well, the, the hard money loan is not income based. He lost pretty specific. Maybe, he lost. He lost. Maybe there's some that will give you like a lower LTV. So on your primary residence, I think you can go, I know you can do 90. Maybe they cut hedges down a bit. So I can go 95. I send them to Golden One. Yeah, Golden One's a little. <laughs> Yeah, they're more conservative, but first tech credit unions, the one I went to, they would go 95. You're going to have a higher interest rate. I think I did 90 or 85 or something like that. And then they'll also do investment properties. In Golden One, I don't think they'll do investment properties, and there's tons. But first tech, um, I think they go like 80% on your investment property, which is not common, right? Maybe they okay. change some of their, their structuring. What about you try to dump Huh? Self directed right now. Yeah, I'm looking into things like that. Like my dad had a self directed, you know, growing up, so I'm familiar with how it works. I think like when you buy a self directed IRA is like having your retirement money very flexible and you put it in this account, and you can buy real estate with it. Or you can lend money to people like me or whatever, right? Um, the cons on it, I've heard, is when you buy real estate, for me and other people, the big thing is the tax sheltering. Right, you get great depreciation and great tax write offs. If you buy it in the self directed IRA, you don't get any of that. You do get the ability for the, your account to appreciate. Um, He's a robber. And I've been looking more at Roth personally. Like I've been kind of, I have a SEP IRA, which I just kind of um, um, put in a, you know, that, the stocks and stuff like that. But I, I like the idea of a Roth IRA, which means you pay the taxes, and then you put it in the account. And then I could buy a flip with my Roth IRA and it pre if I make 20, 30, 40 grand, whatever cash in an account, I'm not taxed on the growth. And I can always outpace the growth of the stock market. I'm more confident in my own ability because I understand the real estate. I don't know what's going on with mutual funds and hedge funds, and I don't, you know, who knows crypto and all that. You know, the conversation. Any other questions on? Well, here, I want to get, yeah, I got a quick oh, okay. So, are you buying these in like as an LLC different in, for each property or not each property? I have an yeah. LLC for the yeah. flips. Okay. Yeah, the rentals, honestly, their own personal name. I think I have one in like a, a court a entity. Um, and I went over that with like my CPA, very common question, but it's like, okay, I got 10 different physical properties with different units. It's like, okay. Entity for property A, property B, property C. It's like that's a lot of tax preparation, a lot of bookkeeping, a lot of uh, you got to pay your CPA if you're doing that, right? It, it costs like four grand for a property just to file taxes every year. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of 
basically put everything under like a, an umbrella policy to have a lot of insurance and don't mess up type thing. But I mean, LLCs and entities, like, I don't know, I've listened to episodes on bigger pockets, like, they're not bulletproof. Like, you do one little thing that's kind of like, oh, is this personal or business? Like, there's ways to get through it and come after you. Yeah. And honestly, <laughs> all my money is in my property bank. I don't mm-hmm. have that much cash. Like, I'm always working out hard money payments. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm always, cash strap is definitely a thing with investing. Like, it looks like, you know, things, I have a good amount of equity in the properties, right? I have good reserves, but it's constantly shuffling out. I'm, re- I'm always reinvesting, which I like, because I know dumb things are by certain things. Like <laughs> and you, to do hard money on a flip, you're gonna, you would have to have an LLC or an entity. Yeah. You can't do it in your personal name. I think for the flips, it's really important too, like having, that's more of a shield, I think, than the rental properties, that that can be more um, going after something that doesn't have any security type of it. And just so you guys know too, the, the way the hard money works, you're putting 10% down on the purchase price, and then 100% of the rehab funds are financed. And then you can take that money out in draws, like a construction loan. So you have, it's gonna cost roughly $200 a draw, Pull the money out, so don't pull out like five thousand dollar increments. Now you're gonna pull out bigger chunks, but and you don't pay interest on that money until you draw it out. And it's kind of great, like you really only your your loans closing costs. Your loans are more than the purchase price. You're getting more money than the property that you're buying. (laughs) But you know, I've bought in properties, you know, two hundred, two fifty, three hundred. You're only putting twenty thousand dollars down. You have the closing costs, but. Um, you know, you do any type of loan, you put, I mean, investment loan, you're putting 20, 30 percent down, so unless you're doing owner occupied, right? So it's, um, and that's like the strategy with uh, having the rental properties too, right? If you get a high enough loan amount and you just do rate and term when you do the exit refi, when you're doing the first strategy, you can do these properties with very little funds kept in the property, or if you get a private investor that gives you. 100% and you get no money in there, right? So um, definitely a lot of advantages when you're thinking creatively on how to utilize these various tools to get ahead of your real estate portfolio for long term. So to answer some of your guys' questions from the beginning, you know, one, if you guys can shoot us an email just so we have your contact information, I'm gonna send some stuff out to you guys, some tools, not just in paper format, but um, I'm going to send you guys a copy of the deal analyzer so you guys can take that. I can send you the offer key. Um, I can send a bunch of stuff to you guys. Don't go into Google Drive and use it in there. Copy it into your own. You don't screw it up or something <laughs> else. The same. Copy it. Just move it into your own folder. It'll literally copy it. It'll take all the calculations with it. Um, if you guys have questions on how to use it, you guys can reach out to me and I'll help you guys out. But somebody talk about estimated cost, right? In that it'll break down, you know, what is your initial like demo, electrical, plumbing, what are all these costs? You know, bedroom one, two, three, and four, bathroom one, two, three, and four, kitchen. It'll break everything down and then it'll populate into another sheet that they will then calculate your acquisition costs, your holding costs, and your resale costs, and then spit out what your profit is. So Knowing what you want to profit, like Bobby mentioned earlier, you target right at that fifty thousand range. Some people might think that's high, but that's like a six month play, right? It's not like oh, just do that right then. So it's a six month play, but you also got to build in a little bit of buffer, right? Especially in this market, what if it changes? What if you open a wall and you know spend another ten grand on something? So you don't want to target say twenty thousand as your profit. You might fail. Right, so that deal analyzer I'll send out to you guys. Um, staying organized, that's a constant process. <laughs> uh, we use we use notes on our phone a lot. You guys have most people have Apple. Yeah, we use shared notes constantly. So projects are in there. There's we use a ton of that. Um, Social media posts, we'll write them in there, and then we both have access to them. Uh, and then we use Google, we use Google Spreadsheets and Google Drive to manage everything, so everybody has access to all of it. 
Um, I can send you guys also a, uh, it's basically like a project management form, so the scope of work, what you're going to do, how much it's going to cost in different stages, makes it a little bit easier to manage it. Uh, financing, where to do financing, kind of talk about that with the hard money, doing it that way. Uh, Turn times on the hard money, 10 to 14 days. It can be faster once we get that pro status. Just because we can rinse and repeat. Your interest rates are also quite a bit lower once you hit that number. Right? And it has to be within a two year span. So you can't do like five flips in your whole life. <laughs> right? It's got to be five in the last 24 months. And that's a hard line, as we found out helping other people. It's, it's a hard line. So they want to see five exits, right? Um, percentage of return, not necessarily a percentage, it's more of a number. Um, and how we calculate it is, you know, heavy, medium, and light. Yeah. That's kind of how we go about it, right? And if, if something's a little tighter, profit margin-wise, then we'll go in there and kind of fine-tune and see really what number can we make work on the deal. And it's it's constantly. I feel like it's it's always evolving, right? It's um, we sold a house that we've had to do absolutely nothing to. We've had some that we just can't collect it, and some that are full to the studs. They're all different. So you've got to look at each deal a little bit different, right? Um, I think so, that's it. So, so you don't have an approximate spread. You look at it across the board, just as get an idea so that people would buy property. I think that formula that we have like 70% or 60%, that's the spread, really. But I mean, it's like, certainly like if it's a heavy fixer, right? And that's why the ARV is, is bigger, right? 50%, like definitely want to make more on if you're doing everything and it's going to take a more sure. time to rate month. If there's a smaller one, like it, it, does, it does vary, right? Like I probably want to do those burnt down properties and only make, 40 or 50, right? Then you have more risk with the longer time. Thanks a bunch, guys. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, yeah. Feedbacks, appreciate it too. Like, we'll have some other classes. And uh, if you want to follow us on Instagram, it's cool too. We're chatting, are very competitive, and I want to have more followers with it.